Um, thank you very much. So uh, sort of the area of this talk is uh, symplectic geometry, which was uh, sort of originated as a mathematical framework for classical mechanics. And um, one of the things I like the most about this field is uh, the sort of often mysterious interplay between dynamics and geometry and topology. So I hope to show a bit of that. Um, we already had several talks in symplectic geometry, but I'll sort of go over the background uh, again, anyhow. So the main objects of study are uh, even dimensional manifolds called symplectic manifolds. These manifolds model the phase space of a mechanical system. So all, all possible positions and moment. They are endowed with a special differential form, which basically enables you to write the equations of motion in a coordinate free way. On such a manifold, we consider functions, smooth functions from the manifold to R. We call them Hamiltonians. We allow them to be time dependent. So here I think of the S1 variable as the time. And they model uh, the energy of uh, such a mechanical system. So if we solve the equations of motion with respect to F, we obtain a flow on the manifold, which we call a Hamiltonian flow, and it basically represents the physical flow of the system. Now, given two such functions, we can uh, consider their Poisson bracket. This operation basically measures how one Hamiltonian changes with respect to the flow of another. So formally, we define the Poisson bracket of F and G by composing F on the flow of G and taking the derivative with respect to the time. So some examples, uh, the Poisson bracket of a function with itself is always zero. This is basically the energy conservation law. Uh, if we look at the example from the previous slides, and then we see that uh, sort of the, this function we drawn here is the standard height function on the round sphere. The flow it generates is basically a rotation of the sphere around the z-axis. So this rotation doesn't change the height of a point, and so the, the height is preserved under the motion. Um, another example is if we take R2 with the standard area form. Um, and we take the functions f and g to be the coordinate functions x and y, then the flow induced by the function y is basically a shift at the x direction with constant speed one. And then the Poisson bracket of uh, x and y measures how x changes with, changes with respect to this flow. So it should be equal to one. So the Poisson bracket is a, a very central operation in classical mechanics, and it admits several surprising rigidity phenomena is coming from symplectic geometry. Uh, one such phenomena was uh, uh, found by Antov and Poltrovich in 2006, and it can be stated in the following way. So you consider a symplectic manifold. So for example, think of a two sphere, and you cover this manifold by uh, open sets. So say an open, open disk covering, covering the sphere. Then you take a subordinate partition of units this is just a collection of functions that are supported in the sets of the cover and sum up to one. You can think of this process as localizing your phase space. What they showed is that if the sets are all small in some symplectic notion of size, then uh, the Poisson bracket of these functions cannot be all zero. So there is at least one pair with non-zero Poisson bracket. Okay, so. Uh, if you interpret uh, the Poisson bracket as a certain noise of this localization, then uh, it means that you, you must have a certain noise if you localize your face and your face space into sufficiently small pieces. So following this result, Poltorovich defined an invariant, which measures the Poisson bracket or the non-commutativity of such collections of functions. So here is a slightly complicated formula. It's not very important for, uh, for our purposes today. Um, I'll just say that basically what's happening here is you take the Poisson bracket of weighted sums of functions from the partition, and then you maximize over the phase space and over the weights, okay? And sort of as a side note relating to uh, BJ stock from last week, you can use Groth and Nixon equality in functional analysis to get rid of these weights and basically replace this invariant by a slightly simpler formula. So this formula gives you a non-negative number for each collection of functions. But if you wanna sort of measure the non-commutativity associated to the open cover, what you do is you take the infimum over all subordinate partitions of unity. Okay. So this invariant here basically measures the, um, the smallest amount of non-commutativity the open cover must have. 
Okay. The motivation for this uh, maybe a little complicated definition comes from operational quantum mechanics in which this Poisson bracket invariant represents a certain noise. And what makes this invariant difficult to compute is this interval, which is over a space of functions, so an infinite dimensional space. Poltrovich also conjectured a lower bound for this invariant. So the conjecture states that there exists a constant depending only on the symplectic manifold. And the emphasis here is that this constant does not depend on the open cover such that the product of the Poisson bracket invariant and uh, the symplectic size of the sets from the cover is bounded from below by this constant. This inequality is interpreted as an uncertainty principle. So if the cover is very localized, it's by a very small set, then the Poisson bracket, which represents noise, should be very large. Okay. You say a word about what the symplectic size is? Yes. So uh, we consider a set to be of small symplectic size if it can be disjoint from itself by a Hamiltonian flow. And the size of the set is uh, the smallest norm. I can say which norm, um, which of a Hamiltonian basically whose flow uh, disjointed in time one. And the norm is uh, Hopper's norm. It's obtained by integrating over the time the oscillation over the pixels. So here's a quick status report on this conjecture. Uh, in dimension two, it is proved in joint work with Pahovsky and Loganov and also by Payet for surfaces other than sphere. Basically the starting point of these proofs is that in dimension two, you could, you could trade in to, uh, dynamics for geometry. So this conjecture is a dynamical statement involving Poisson bracket, which measure, measures non-commutativity of flows. And then, the point is that in dimension two, you can translate this question into a geometrical question. This question is still not easy, but somehow approachable. In higher dimensions, you can't do that. And so the conjecture is still open. It's open in the sense that uh, there is not a single higher dimensional manifold on which this uh, inequality is established, okay? Um, there are several works that made advances towards this conjecture, and when I say advances, I mean uh, proving this inequality with the constant here depending on the cover, so not establishing really an uncertain difference. Um, these works uh, rely on heavy tools in symplectic geometry, more specifically on a homology theory called fluoromology. So let me say a few words about that. So fluoromology is a beautiful construction which basically enables you to relate, sorry, enables you to relate the Hamiltonian dynamics happening on the manifold with the topology of the manifold. So a very sort of rough description of, of this construction is the following. So we have our even dimensional manifold, M, and we look at the loop space. So every point here is a loop on the manifold. On this loop space, we have a functional, a special functional called the action functional. Uh, what's special about this functional is that critical points of this functional correspond to one periodic orbits of the Hamiltonian flow. So this is the least action principle. So the starting point of this construction is considering a vector space formally generated by the critical points of this functional or equivalently by the one periodic orbits of the Hamiltonian flow. So this is where the dynamics enter the story. In order to make this vector space into a chain complex, we need to define a linear map called a differential map. And this map is defined by counting negative gradient flow lines of this action functional. So these flow lines are paths in the loop space, so the paths of loops. And so in the base manifold, they look like cylinders connecting to one periodic orbits. These cylinders are actually solutions of a cauchy riemann type partial differential equation, which is called floor equation with the boundary conditions being the one periodic orbits of the Hamiltonian flow, okay? So this results in a chain complex. And if you take the homology of this chain complex, uh, miraculously, it turns out to be independent of the Hamiltonian generating the flow and is actually a topological invariant of the manifold. So you started with the Hamiltonian dynamics and you ended up with a topological invariant. Now, out of this construction, we can define a dynamical invariant of the Hamiltonian uh, F, which is called the spectral invariant of F. Roughly speaking, this uh, invariant measures the smallest uh, action, action value that, uh, that you can 
sort of generate the whole homology here just by considering orbits up to this action. So it's like the smallest value of the action functional that you need in order to see the total homology here. These invariants are a very useful tool in uh, studying dynamical properties of Hamiltonian flows. So for example, you can use them to detect periodic points of the flow, or you can use them to study Poisson brackets. So this was done by Anton Poltrovich and Zabolsky and then uh, uh, but another refinement to, to Poltrovich. So what they showed is that you can produce lower bands to this product appeared, that appeared in the conjecture by studying spectral invariants of Hamiltonians supported in disjoint sets of the cover. So you take two sets from your cover that are disjoint, and you consider Hamiltonians supported in this disjoint union. And then you analyze the spectral invariants of such Hamiltonians, and there is some machinery that you can apply to get lower bands for this product. So this is basically what is done uh, in all of the works I stated under in the context of Poltrovich conjecture in higher dimensions. So what they do is they study these Poisson bracket of these special uh, Hamiltonians, and then they apply this orange arrow to get lower bands. The way uh, they study spectral invariants uh, of such Hamiltonians is very indirect. So if you look at the functional sending a Hamiltonian to its spectral invariant, this is a very nice functional having uh, some nice properties. And what you can do is you can forget about how you define this invariant, just sort of look at a functional with this pro these properties. And by analyzing the properties, you can deduce some corollaries uh, uh, of how, how spectral invariants of such Hamiltonians should look. Um, another approach you can take is the direct approach. So we define these invariants uh, through the Flora chain complex. So we can try and analyze the chain complex directly for Hamiltonians of this shape. Now the floor chain complex was uh, composed of the vector space generated by the orbits and this differential map, right? Um, on the level of dynamics of this vector space, there is no interaction between uh, this jointly supported Hamiltonians. So basically uh, the Hamiltonian, the flow induced by G is completely constant on the support of F and vice versa, these flows commute and you can easily decompose the vector space into sort of stuff happening here and stuff happening there. Um, but in, in the homology, there is interaction, and this is due to the differential. So the differential counts uh, these cylinders connecting periodic orbits, and a priori it is possible to have a cylinder going from a one periodic orbit uh, in the support of F to a periodic orbit in the support of G. And there's actually uh, sort of this, this uh, interaction, it's not, it, it, I'm not saying it might happen, I'm saying it happens. But you can still try and say, okay, maybe we can limit this interaction somehow. And uh, in a joint work with Ganor, we showed that when the second homotopy group of uh, the manifold vanishes, you can construct something we call a barricade around the support of these functions by uh, performing a C-infinity small perturbation that basically prevents these cylinders from going in and out of the support. And this sort of limits the interaction uh, in floor homology and enables you to get uh, a nice sort of uh, upper triangular shape for, for the differential map. <clears throat> if, if this condition on the, so this condition on the second homotopy group uh, might seem a little odd in the first glance, but actually floor homology behaves very differently in the presence of non-trivial spheres. So if you ask what might happen in the presence of non-trivial spheres, uh, they help the cylinders cross the barricade. So it is actually, it's not that uh, sort of, uh, we don't manage to build such a barricade, is that it is not possible to get such a strong uh, restriction on the behavior of these cylinders in the presence of non-trivial spheres. Um, and so what we, we might try and do in, in the presence of spheres is uh, consider some additional assumptions to our setup uh, under which maybe we can say some, some weaker assertions. So for example, maybe if the supports are far, far enough from each other, then uh, these cylinders would get tired on the way and won't be able to get all the way to the other set. Uh, or if we restrict enough the geometry or topology of the set. So these things haven't been done yet uh, in, in, in this case, basically. Um, but I think I'm also out of time, so I'll stop here. Thank you.
Are there any questions? So what, what does it mean support for now? Because in R to N, I can always conjugate far things to close. Right. Um, so I was thinking of the uh, closed manifold setting. But when I'm saying uh, far enough, I mean that they have a large enough neck, so a large enough neighborhood in which sort of the structure is cylinder, cylindrical. Sorry. Um, yeah, because then you can sort of, hopefully, you can know something of the in, about the energy of uh, traveling trajectories. So these are bands that are known for hom holomorphic curves, um, and they are not true as is for floor trajectories, because Morse trajectories can travel long ways with small energies. Um, but sort of maybe if you force them to climb uphill, then they will need a lot of energy. The symplectic side, is it ju just the area in two dimensions or? Is yes, it, it's the area of the smallest capping disc. So basically, if you want to disjoint an annulus from itself, you will still have to disjoint the whole. Right, so you are actually, right? So maybe I can draw a picture. So if, if you have an annulus uh, on say R2 or on S2, and then you want to disjoint it from itself, then you actually need to disjoint this whole region from itself. And so it would be the area of the smallest capping disk. In that case, the proof that you have of the lower bound uses you said geometry what kind of just what kind of input yeah so um so it's actually a um sort of it's actually a nice construction so basically you can translate the question of uh bounding plus some brackets of a pair of functions uh into counting intersections of their level sets um this is this is due to the fact that uh sorry this is due to the fact that so there are two ways to interpret this. One is that the Poisson bracket is the Jacobian of a map of the pair map uh, FG from M to R2. And another way, which is, I think, more uh, sort of a more geometrical to see it, is that if you want to, if you understand, if you want to understand how much F changes under the flow of G, then you sort of flow along the flow lines of G, which basically correspond to level sets in dimension two. And then you, you want to know if, if you are able to get from this low level set to this high level set. And so this is translated to counting intersections of level sets. And this is the geometrical question that we deal with. Is there a version of this invariant to the Lagrangian content? So this is Lagrangian plurality? Maybe you can just study displaceability questions. Um, so there isn't a version uh, in the Lagrangian setting. I'm trying to recall if I remember anyone suggesting that before, but there isn't something, you know, built. Yeah. And have people thought about the case of P stars too as a high dimensional symplectic manifold in the cases they use stars? So the conjecture is only for uh, closed manifolds, it does not hold in and then closed manifolds. I would guess as a, if you want to take like the first higher dimensional manifold to try and prove the conjecture on, I would start with T4. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And maybe with a, like even for the, for covers by uh, contractible sets, like topological balls. I should say that for uh, small enough balls and the smallest with respect to a compatible metric, this is known in higher dimensions. There's a beautiful argument to, to Kulturovich. There are no other questions. Let's thank the speaker.